thank you for 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 tuning in for clicking on uh, on this video uh, we have this discussion hundreds and hundreds of times a season with riders that are bringing their snowmobiles in for setup uh, and discussing compression damping this this video is is going to discuss compression damping as it pertains to a snowmobile the uh, the discussion and the explanations are very similar whether it's a snowmobile or an ATV a side by side or even a motorcycle but the uh, the examples we're going to use are, are pertain to uh, to snowmobiles um, a lot of OEM shocks simply don't have compression damping and has been lost as the accountants have uh, have won meetings over the years to bring the cost of the snowmobile down while still trying to maintain the uh, retail price or the value as 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 things change we the consumer are the ones that seem to lose as these options are slowly removed or or refined or reduced to us so anyway we're going to talk uh, briefly about compression damping here as it pertains to a snowmobile uh, the first we're going to talk about some nomenclature some some wording uh, first uh, one of the very first things we're we're going to clear up is the the term shock absorber a shock is uh, is a damper um, inside the, the shock surrounded by a spring that's what they call a coil over shock absorber so that's uh, when we talk about the term shock we need to separate the spring function which is the support of the vehicle from the damper inside which looks after motion. Um, there, the compression damping, when, when we say compression damping, it is the, uh, the ski coming up or the skid coming up as we, as we hit a bump or as we jump and land, um, as we let off throttle and the, the machine settles, all those motions are compression. The rebound is the recovery, uh, the ski going back out, the skid going back out. That's what we call the rebound uh, direction. Uh, we'll, you'll hear us use the name clicker. Um, I've got a, a shock handy here, but when we talk about a clicker, or the, the compression clicker is the adjuster or the, the bypass around the internal uh, valving of the shock. We'll, we'll discuss that a little bit more later. Um, the compression clicker is there on most shock absorbers and the rebound clicker, when the shock has one, is on the bottom of the shock absorber. Um, the, uh, you'll hear some suspension technicians discuss high and low speed damping or, or you'll see that in, in your literature, your brochure, if your snowmobile has that. Uh, when, they, when they talk about high and low speed damping, they're not talking about the speed of the vehicle. They're talking about the speed of the actual damper. Uh, low speed function is a gentle G out. If you're on the throttle and you let off the throttle the way the front end settles, those are low speed functions. Um, and a high speed is, is more when, when we hit a bump. Um, that's a high speed function. It generates a higher speed shock in the damper. Um, both when we do a setup and we're, we're working with installing shocks into a machine, uh, the spring function sets the initial ride height of it. And then the, the damper, it kind of takes over once the vehicle is moving. And they, they kind of, they both have to be right. And they can both affect ride height. Um, if we add compression damping, the, the, the average ride height of the vehicle will be higher. And if we open the compression damping, the vehicle will ride a little bit lower. We'll visit that again in a bit, but uh, but they kind of both have to be right. Um, if a shock is bottoming, shock absorber is bottoming, uh, we can't just blame the spring and, and say, oh, we got to add more preload. If there's no oil inside the damper, the strongest spring in the world will bottom it, it because it doesn't have that that resistance to motion. So both the spring and the damper inside have to work together to be a shock absorber and and keep you suspended keep you off of the bumps uh, keep you off the of bottom uh, bottoming is we try to generally avoid that if we can uh, bottoming when the shock finally gets through all of its travel and hits bottom and we get that impact that's when the shock is done doing its job and and we we get that through the bars or through the through our back as as a as a negative uh, a negative impact to to the, to the machine and we want to try to avoid that. 
But on the other hand, bottoming once or twice an hour is way better than having a machine that's so stiff it never bottoms, then, then it would be very uncomfortable to ride. So when we look at a stock shock absorber, this is a stock shock that comes on many, many, many Skidoo models right up until 2022. Uh, it, it's the stock shock, stock ski shock for an X model. Um, the XRS has a little bit higher uh, capability shock with just a piggyback reservoir and compression damping on it. But you see the damper inside with the spring on the outside. Now, this shock is pretty handicapped in its function. It has no compression damping whatsoever, no rebound damping whatsoever. So they really engineered this shock to work properly, work well at one speed and one trail condition. Uh, if the trail gets any bumpier than that, you start to lose control. Uh, if you're going slower than the shock is designed, it's a little bit harsh, so it's it's very limited in its capability, um, we say. Um, so compression damping, to circle back to compression damping, I'll stay there. Um, the valving that's inside, the high speed valving that's inside that we can't get at quickly, it is what it is for most of us. And then the adjuster on the outside of the shock uh, allows a bypass around around the valving that's inside. Um, so as we open that adjuster, we're allowing more and more oil to go around the, uh, the it bypasses the, the damping stack. It provides an alternate route to, to the damping that's inside the shock. There's a small cartridge in the, under the head of the piggyback that has a certain shim stack to it. So as we open that adjuster, the oil is permitted to go around it. So the shock becomes softer. So we say we, we open that adjuster and we can have a very couch-like, a very comfortable ride. And as we close the adjuster, the damping of the shock will get firmer and firmer and firmer. And it'll become more like a sports car. So the, having the, the function of compression damping allows us to tune. We say we tune the vehicle to our mood. Um, in the morning, if we're aggressive, if we're riding quickly with our friends, we may choose a stronger setting and the machine will have a lot more platform, it'll have a lot, a lot more stability. We'll be able to ride it quicker without it bottoming. So we'll be, we'll, we'll be able to keep the machine in control a lot better. And then we stop for lunch, we have a big burger and a fry or a poutine or something. And then, and then we just want to get back to the truck. Everybody's riding much slower. So we can open that shock up, open the compression damping up, and the shock will move a lot easier, uh, be a lot more comfortable. And, um, and so that now by that simple adjust, uh, addition of damping, compression damping, we can increase the window of where the shock works. Over what conditions does it work well? It works very soft in the uh, when we want it to, or it can be very firm when we want it to. Um, we talked briefly about ride height. So the one, the one impression, the one function of compression damping is that it can control the comfort of the ride. The second function that we talk about with compression damping is, is the ride height. The, we call it the dynamic ride height. The static ride height of the vehicle, if we, if we take preload out of the ski shocks and we lower the nose down, we, we flatten those A-arms out so that it handles a lot better with less inside ski lift, um, that's a physical change to the static ride height. We've taken preload out, we've lowered the nose of that snowmobile, uh, we, we expect it to handle flatter if we adjust limiter strap and we'll discuss that in another video. But, um, but that, so that sets the static ride height in the front. And then by adjusting the preload on the torsion springs or changing the torsion springs, if we're a heavier rider or two up, uh, or we carry fuel caddy, whatever that load is, we're, we're then setting the geometry. We say the geometry of the snowmobile, but we're setting it statically. And then we have the nerve to go and ride that machine and, and it, it moves around, it moves around up and down, up and down, which which brings us back to compression and rebound damping. The compression damping, if we, if we open those adjusters up and we go down a, a, a trail, a, a very, even a smooth trail, 
um, the shocks are going up and down, up and down, up and down as we go, go across that trail. Years and years of looking at telemetry data, data acquisition from super bikes and, and our uh, other motorcycles, which is where our history came from, we see that even on pavement, the, the suspension is moving all the time as the, the nuances of even pavement and the tires going around, they, there's movement. But on a snowmobile, we see even more of that. So if we open the compression clickers way up and go down a typical smooth trail, we'll see down three inches, up three inches, down three inches, up three inches as it's going down that smooth trail. So that gives us an average ride height of about down an inch and a half. And then if we close the compression damping, we, we wind this clicker in, we firm up the shock, then it will be going down two inches, up two inches, down two inches, up two inches. So it has an average of one inch of ride height. So by stiffening up the ski shocks, for example, the vehicle will sit higher going down the trail. So it's a very interesting um, uh, phenomenon or interesting observation that by adding compression from the skis or adding it out back to the rear shock, we can actually affect the, the geometry of the snowmobile. Here in the shop, when we're doing setups of the machine, we talk about the three points of contact, the skis, the center, and the rear. Uh, the, so when we, we bring a machine in for setup, we adjust the preload, we, we likely, we often change the springs um, the, the rate of the springs will go dual rate uh, often with a lot of our, our, if we're doing an Elka installation to give the customer a higher, higher quality shock. Um, we install dual rate springs, we set the preload to set the initial ride height of the machine. And then we, we educate them that once they get moving, the ride height can then be affected by the compression damping. If you firm the damping up, the average ride height will be higher. And if you soften the compression damping, the average ride height will be lower. Uh, it'll be more comfortable, but it'll also be more prone to bottoming. So therein lies the adjustability of the package. If, you're, if you want comfort, you open the compression damping without ruining the setup. Uh, and if you want to ride aggressively, ride quicker, you firm up the compression damping so the machine's not bottoming. Uh, so yeah, we talked about going through the three points of contact. Um, so we say three points, meaning the skis as one point, the center and the rear. So if we think about these three points of contact um, and we're on our machine, we're in the corner and we have, we've missed, we've had it to accelerated technologies. We put proper torsion springs in, we've adjusted the preload to get the rear sag the way we want it. Uh, the front preload is set to give us flat A arms. The limiter strap is probably set where we want it to give us a, a nice balance through the machine. And then the day is warming up and we're starting to get push through the corners. Uh, at that point, we can, we can uh, look at our compression damping and we can go to our ski shocks and we can firm up the damping of the ski shocks. We can add some compression so that the shock is, is firmer in, in the up direction. The, as, the, as the ski is coming up over the bumps, it takes longer to come up. Um, then, so the, the force of the ski becomes higher than the center. We've taken some weight off of the center and we've put it on the carbides. We've put it on the skis purely by adding compression damping. If we have a compression damping center shock, we could soften the damping up on there. And that, as the machine goes through the bumps, that will make the skis more dominant and the center more relaxed, more, uh, you know, less dominant. And, and the carbides will get better grip. Oftentimes, I've been with riders who are pushing through the corners. They're not getting any ski lift. So the setup is pretty close, but they just want a bit more ski bite. And we add some compression damping and boom, they get it. So that's... That's the, the compression damping affects the comfort versus the anti-bottoming of the shock first. Secondly, it affects the ride height. It has an effect of the dynamic. The, the ride height as we're going down the trail can be affected with the compression damping. And then one of the other things I'll talk about is another way to think about compression damping to help you 
uh, I help you identify it, help you visualize it, is, is we'll talk about it over time. Um, so if we take the spring off the shock and we, we put it in the vise and we crush it down, when the damper is wide open, let's say it takes a, a half a second to bottom that shock absorber. And then as we close the clicker, as we take this compression clicker and we wind it shut, and then we try to compress it, it takes two seconds or three seconds or four seconds to bottom that shock. We'll use the example two seconds. So a half a second at wide open and two seconds at, at shut. So now we put it in the machine. We put the springs on, we put it in the machine, we head down the trail, and, and here's a bump coming. Let's say the bump is five, six inches high and three feet long, a very typical bump. And at 30 mile an hour, it, it would take one, one second to bottom that shock absorber. So then we can say, hey, if, 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 my, if the Elka shock has 24 clicks of adjustability and I'm at 12, 13, 14 clicks out, it's probably just gonna bottom. And then if I wind that thing in three or four clicks, it's not going to bottom. The shock doesn't have time to, to bottom. It runs out of time because we're basically, we've hit the bump and we're past it in, in one second. So depending on where we have that clicker set, the shock could either bottom or it's not going to bottom. So we're just trying to help you visualize that the, the resistance of the of the damper as we wind the compression clicker in, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. So as we're pounding through the bumps, quite often we're going fast enough that we're past the bump. And the shock is now on the rebound cycle, it's on the recovery cycle and it won't bottom. So the, the, the stock, the OEM damper is gonna work well for you at one speed, one maximum speed, and one set of bump, one one set of bump situations, one 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 frequency of bumps. If, if the trail is very is very choppy, it may bottom, and if we try to go faster, it may bottom. So once we step into the world of an adjustable shock absorber, that's when we can start to tune the shock for for the terrain and tune it for our speed. Stock, they work well for one scenario. Once we have adjustability, then we can, then we can tune it for, for the, the, how bumpy it is that day and how quick we want to ride that snowmobile and keep in control. So that's, uh, uh, that's compression damping. We're going to go now and have a look at some shocks and, and point to the compression adjusters, talk about some options that are available and, uh, and, uh, and explain a little bit more from there. So we're going to head over to our bench now and continue. Okay, here we are uh, over at our one of our service tables here. I've got some shocks laid out and we're going to kind of go through them again discussing primarily in this video compression damping, what we have to offer, what some of the OEM offerings are and our thoughts on those. Um, um, we're, we're big Elka dealer here. They, they work very, very well with us. Uh, we've got a great engineering relationship with them. They're a fantastic shock absorber. So here we, we sell primarily Elka uh, as well as modify OEM shocks. So that's why all my examples here are of the Elka product. Plus we've got some KYB and Walker Evans on the table um, to kind of point and, uh, and show you some of the OEM options. But uh, here we're going to look down now at some of the stock shocks. Um, this is a stock shock absorber off a 2022 uh, Skidoo MXZ uh, X package. Um, so again, a very, very, very basic shock absorber. It is serviceable. You can see by the nitrogen fitting on the top. Um, but this shock is very limited. We can't get down to a zero preload situation. This adjusting mechanism does not permit it. So we often change the springs on this shock absorber to a custom dual rate setup we created here in the building um, for customers that are 
uh, limited financially or, or limited with their budget to using this shock, we can, we can go dual rate on the springs and, and make it a little bit better. But again, there's no piggyback reservoir uh, where we can put a compression damping adjuster. So, and if we look down at the bottom of the shock, there is no rebound facility on it. Uh, so that's uh, the vast majority of OEM shocks is something of this nature. The next shock we step to here is uh, Elka's Stage 2 shock absorber. It is their lowest cost shock absorber designed for OEM replacement. If you go to your dealer to replace a shock, you'll often find that the cost of these Elkas is very similar, but we're stepping into a dual rate spring. The main spring is currently off this. Um, when Jen gets your order here in the building, we pick the tender spring, she picks a main spring based on your, your rider weight and what you're doing with the machine um, to customize it for you. But the Stage 2 has, Elka calls it a rebound damping adjuster. The knob is just off in the, in the package, it's a brand new shock. Um, they call that their Stage 2, they call it rebound but in actuality, when the, when the oil is not leaving the shock, but just going around the piston as it's going up and down inside the shock, that rebound adjuster is doing a blend of compression and rebound. So that's why it's on the table here, why we're talking about it in compression damping uh, video, is because that rebound adjuster is doing a blend of compression and rebound. So when we open that clicker up, the shock gets softer in both directions. And when we close that clicker down, the shock is going to get stronger in both directions. So it's, I call it a damping. It's a blended damping adjuster. Um, and then the dual rate spring with the in, you can see the infinite preload we have on the body there. I'll just slide that down um, so that we can we can set that thing, we can get to zero preload. On this KYB, we cannot. That shock is, is limited to 10 millimeters of preload, so we're never gonna get a flat A-arm situation with that shock absorber unless we change to one of our spring kits. So that's Elka's stage two. Uh, that fitting up there is purely a nitrogen fitting. It is, we're not to touch that, except during the servicing of the shock. So the next ski shock that they have in their arsenal is the Stage 3. And uh, it has what we call a piggyback reservoir. It's coming with a dual rate springs to hold the machine up, to set the preload where we want it. Infinite preload adjustability. This shock's been to a hundreds of trade shows, so it's a little bit marked up. But uh, the, there we can see the piggyback reservoir and lo and behold where our compression damper is. So that as the oil is leaving the shock, when the shock is compressing, it goes by this, this metering valve and there's where we can give it 24 clicks of adjustability to fine tune that, uh, that function. Do we want it soft and couch-like or do we want a sports car? Do we want a race car? Do we want it a bit stronger to give us more support? So that's their stage three, very economical shock. You can peek down here at the bottom and you can see no rebound adjustability. So it's our, it's our, when the customer has a little bit of budget to play with, that is a fantastic ski shock right there. The next shock in Elka's arsenal is a stage four. And that, the only difference there is they've got the same rebound mechanism. The cylinder head is exactly the same. The piggyback is exactly the same but down here we can see a rebound adjuster. And we're going to do a separate video on, on the benefits of rebound, um, but the rebound gives us unbelievable control over the ride. Um, and we, we don't get afraid of it. We, we give our, our, our customers uh, full training on how to adjust that shock. But, um, but that's the rebound available in the stage four. So again, you're getting dual rate springs with any of Elka shock absorbers, the stage two, three, four, or onward to the stage five, uh, with a host of valving, uh, not valving, some spring options, compression, uh, main spring, tender spring. So we can get the ride height of the machine where we want it, we can get the preload where we want it, and then you, we give you the adjustability. 
This is probably our most popular shock absorber with compression and rebound damper. Then our, we're going to step on to the flagship. The, they used to call it the race shock, uh, the stage five. Um, but we see more and more consumers going to this once we train them on high and low speed compression. And as we talked earlier in the video, low speed compression is for the gentle motion of the snowmobile. And then when we, when we hit those sharp edged bumps or we drop a, we drop a, a jump and we land it, that's where the high speed valving uh, takes over and controls that portion of the shock. And again, we have rebound as well on the stage five. So this is what we run on our personal machines in the building. It is an unbelievably advanced shock and it has, it has the adjustability of low and high speed damping as well as rebound damping. I've got here a couple of the cartridges so that you can see what I've seen internally in here. The stage four damping cartridge this guy here the knob just resides on top and it threads into the uh, into the shock um, but it has a fixed high speed shim stack here and then the bleeder around that is what your knob is controlling and the only difference between that and the stage five the stage five we have an adjustable basically an adjustable shim stack. We can wind the high speed down and it acts like an adjustable pressure relief valve. So we can tune how big a hit do we want to hit before this check system bypasses and takes the impact. So it's a very neat system that Elk has got there where they've got the, the high speed adjusted on the outer ring, the low speed adjusted on the inner ring, so we can keep the shock compliant over the over the soft bumps and yet introduce protection uh, over the big hits. So it's our favorite shock, but in, in honesty, the stage four is what we sell the most of. Um, and the stage five, when the customer really understands the benefit of tuning uh, small bump comfort versus big, big bump protection. Uh, so that's Elka's offering here. I've got a selection of crossovers we keep five different crossover heights in the building and that is this guy right here you can see it here in the shock and we did a separate video on dual rate springs uh, called dual rate springs explained but when you order a set of shocks from us and jen does the uh, the installation of the springs and tests your shock we pick a crossover height to give you how much uh, soft comfort do we want versus how much bump protection of the main of the main spring so that's Elka's product range and what we sell here in the building. Um, this is a uh, this is a high end velocity 2.0. This sh this shock, this Walker Evans shock, is available um, on the Polaris XCR series. Uh, their high end bump bump sleds will use a sh will use this shock absorber. It's got a fairly large rod like the Elka's but it, again, it has no facility for rebound. So it's quite limited um, in the handling. It's good through the bumps. It's got low and high speed protection. Uh, another um, issue, another theory that Walker is using here is once the piston gets by the main chamber over to the reservoir, it traps oil up in this portion of the shock to further in increase the damping. But that makes the shock quite stiff in the bottom portion of the travel. So it's a, it's a bump protection theory, not a handling theory. And some of the race teams we've worked with have reported that they've burst that at low temperatures and very, very big hits. They've, they've cracked and they've failed the shock absorber. And with Elka, we've worked with uh, different reservoir lengths here to try to make the shock actually do the other thing. We want it soft. And, and compliant down in the bottom and we use the dual rate springs to give us that extra support in the bottom of the travel. Uh, this is a rear shock out of an Arctic Cat or a Yamaha, uh, the Pro Cross chassis. Um, this, is, this is the damping that they give you 
with the rear shock on some of their models. They, we hope you like it. It has no adjustability for compression or rebound. It is rebuildable though. That's a Fox Zero Pro, although it, it has no badging on it to, to indicate that. Uh, this is out of a 22 MXZ. We've, we've robbed the knob for a customer, but this is a very decent shock. It's their Pro, Pro 36 shock absorber uh, with compression damping, but again, no rebound control. Uh, continuing down the bench here discussing uh, sh shock absorbers with compression, uh, this is a Fox, what they call their QS3. Now this is a rear shock out of a Yamaha Sidewinder um, and it has the blade three position adjuster. And it, that, that's become very popular and it actually works okay in the skid frame, but we have our problems with it when used in a ski shock application because this three position adjuster is kind of doing what Elka is doing, but it, it has orifices, uh, orify, uh, whatever the plural is for orifice, but it has three, it should have three holes, but in actuality it has a large hole, so the shock is very soft in position one, a smaller bypass bleed hole in position two, which we still think is too soft, and then on three there's no hole at all. So the shock gets crazy stiff, and you can please, if you've got this shock on the front of your uh, Yamaha or Articat, um, go out to the front bumper, set them both to position one and push on that front bumper and you'll find that the, the snowmobile is very, very, very soft. Go to two and push it again. You probably won't feel a difference. I can hardly feel a difference. And then you go to three and it locks the snowmobile up. It's a, it's a crazy progression there that, that Fox has given, given their, their, uh, these models. I think uh, we, we do a revalve of this or we can change that cartridge out for, for, a, for a dramatic improvement in making those three adjustments uh, far more user friendly. Um, and again, no rebound adjustability. And then this is, uh, this is, we see this shock on some of the older models, on some of the lower end entry models, but this one is not even, it's not even serviceable. There's no nitrogen facility in it at all. Um, it, we, we could get it apart, we can see a seal there where we could service the shock, but no compression, no rebound. Uh, it's got the we hope you like it valving in it. So That's been our tour of compression damping, um, how compression damping uh, can dramatically improve your safety, your comfort, your experience, um, and hopefully you can visit us and we can hook you up with a shock absorber that dramatically exceeds any expectations you've ever had. So thank you for tuning in and uh, keep an eye out for our other videos on rebound and setup, uh, which we'll be uh, releasing shortly. Thank you for, for tuning in.